By the 12th century, Christian and Muslim leaders have taken a violent turn toward religious purification in an effort to strengthen their position. Ironically, through this conflict, Christian, Muslim, and Jewish knowledge meet at a new crossroads as the borders of conquest and the barriers of culture shift. As conditions worsen, refugees continue to flee the puritanical rule of the Omohads. Among them, a gifted Jewish student, Moses Ben Maimon, also known as Maimonides, who will become one of the greatest philosophers in Jewish history. Here you have a Jew who is extremely learned in the Jewish tradition, but also very well versed in the general intellectual, um, in the, the themes of general intellectual life, particularly in the sciences and philosophy. He was born in Spain, but he lived at a time of systematic persecution. Maimonides' family had to flee, though he always retained the memory of being from Sfarad. He calls himself Moshe HaSfaradi, Moses the Sfarad, the, Sfar the Sephardic Jew. On his journey, the boy takes with him the passion for knowledge born in that broken city so many years before. Over the years, Maimonides travels from Spain into North Africa and on to Egypt, where he is welcomed into the court of its leader, Saladin, in 1165. Revered today for his important work on philosophy and law, Maimonides spends much of his life studying the Arabic translations of the Greek philosopher Aristotle. Maimonides' scholarship on Aristotle is seen as controversial in the 12th century, as much of Aristotle's science seems to conflict with religion. Maimonides is the one who really takes upon himself to demonstrate that you can be a full adherent of Aristotelian philosophy and still remain loyal to the religious tradition. These things can be harmonized. One of Maimonides' contemporaries, a Muslim scholar named Ibn Rushd, also known as Averroes in the West, is able to stay in Cordoba and debate the problem of philosophy with his fellow Muslims. Averroes was, like Maimonides, was a religious lawyer by training and a philosopher. And he also developed a philosophical system that made room for the uh, Greek philosophical tradition and found ways to explain the Islamic system in such a way as to harmonize with it. The problem of reconciling the science of Aristotle with the religious scriptures is common to Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. But through the work of Averroes, all three religions are able to expand their philosophies. Averroes wrote uh, voluminous commentaries on the works of Aristotle, commentaries which then uh, were avidly read in Europe uh, and translated into Latin and were in many uh, ways responsible for helping to spark uh, our own uh, European interest uh, or, or the rekindling of interest in, in Aristotle. Students even today at almost any Catholic seminary in the world uh, are going to study some of the theological and philosophical works of Thomas Aquinas. And what we don't often think about is that Thomas Aquinas and his colleagues built their theology uh, largely around the philosophical works of Aristotle. And they got their Aristotle through translations that took place uh, in the Muslim world and in Spain. The valuable work of scholars like Maimonides and Averroes will come to the West through an unlikely portal, the now Christian city of Toledo. In Toledo, an archbishop launches a movement of translation. Its mission, to take the knowledge created in Al-Andalus and brought from the East and make it available to the West. Toledo became the primary center in which Arabic knowledge was translated and then transmitted into uh, Europe. Uh, 
pretty much uh, a large number of, of scholars from all over Europe who were interested in acquiring the best science and knowledge of the time, which was Arabic knowledge, came to Toledo to, to study. The new clarified Aristotelian worldview which people like Ibn Rushd and Maimonides helped create captures the imagination of thinkers who are interested in rationally understanding the world. And of course, to find uh, the personnel uh, to make these translations, we're going to end up with teams that are putting together a Muslim and a Christian, or a, a Christian and a Jew. In the 12th century, Toledo is a bustling city, filled with refugees from Almohad rule, many of whom who had been scholars in the intellectual communities of Cordoba and Seville. So all of these things are percolating in, in Christian Spain, thanks in part to the rather tragic uh, collapse of the Christian and Jewish communities in Muslim Spain. An Italian scholar, Gerard of Cremona, comes to Toledo to study the Arabic texts and befriends a Muslim scholar named Ghalib. Together, they started working on translating a number of the of the materials, Arabic materials, which were available in the libraries of Toledo. They started translating them into, into Latin. Ghalib would translate from uh, Arabic into Castilian, and Toledo and uh, Gerard of Cremona would translate from Castilian into, into Latin. So we have these wonderful little laboratories uh, that are interfaith uh, experiments, in a sense. And to me, one of the important lessons they give us is that in the end, the society is richest uh, when each um, individual civilization and culture is bringing something to the table, as opposed to thinking uh, my society, my culture, my religion alone knows everything worth knowing. It is here in Toledo that the great work of the Muslim scholars will be understood and eventually carried into Europe planting the seeds of what will one day become the Renaissance. Toledo was the center that enabled this Renaissance, a revival of knowledge, of, of rational and scientific knowledge, and literature, literary knowledge as, as well in Europe was enabled through this, uh, through this activity. A lot of the early explorers of the generation of Columbus and just before and just after uh, would have used astrolabes uh, 